stolen horses, train hopping, two friends on the lamb. Sounds like a recipe that would top the box office. But for the man in today's story, well, we'll see his life was far from a movie. So saddle up because we've got quite a story today. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast, where we share the gospel of Jesus Christ through the art form of audio drama. Yes, yes, and that includes sound effects. I'm Timothy Gregory, bringing to you the story of a man who ran from his crimes, from the law, and from God. We'll learn just what kind of toll such a chaotic life can take on someone in today's Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast. Also, you want to stick around because later we're going to give the rest of you an opportunity to enter yet another sweepstakes drawing for a prize. Now, it's not a cash prize, but it is a prize, and I think it's a prize that you are really going to like if we draw your name. But first, let's get to it, folks. The classic true story of William Cole Wilcox, Part 1. I'm glad you boys responded to Mr. Moody's invitation. Son, do you want to be a Christian? I don't know. What other brand you peddling? According to God's word, if you're outside of Christ, you're lost. Here, I'll let you read it for yourself. No, ma'am, I ain't lost. I'm in Chicago, Illinois, on Canal Street. (laughs) Johnny, don't try to be funny. Not here, not now. And how is it with your soul, son? I... I don't know. But I'd like to hear Mr. Moody some more. Oh, me too. I want to get his autograph. <laughs> <clears throat> Miss Stewart, may I be of service? Mr. Moody, I thought these boys were serious about the fate of their souls, but it seems to them like a big joke. A joke, huh? I'm sorry, boys, but we've others to assist, so I'm going to have to ask you to leave. Oh, yeah? Yes. Once in a while, a story comes to us which is much too full to attempt telling it in one chapter. Such is that of William Cullen Wilcox. It takes us back to the turbulent era of the Wild West and the last quarter of the 19th century. The story of William Cullen Wilcox was told us by his son, Mark. Each episode could stand alone, yet each relates to the others to tell the complete story. Today, you'll hear the first chapter, right now on Unshackled. My dad was usually called Cull Wilcox. He got uncomfortable when someone called him William Cullen. He was born on a small farm in Ohio. His father, my grandfather, was a doctor earlier in his life, but gave up practice when he discovered he could make more money as the head of a freighting business on the Cuyahoga River Canal and the operator of a 200-acre farm. He was a tall, stern man who seldom spoke unless spoken to. There he lived with his 10-year-old son, my dad. Oh, where are you, boy, when I need you? I'm right here, Pa. I'm just resting in the cool behind this rain barrel. Yeah, you can do your resting tonight. There's work to be done now. Yes, sir. Take this jug out to the men in the fields. What's in it, Pa? Uh, lemonade. Oh, it's heavy. Yeah, just set it down every little ways. And don't spill any. I won't, Pa. Cole really hadn't been planning on drinking any, but that two-gallon jug was heavy. That sun was hot, and each step only made him thirstier. Under the shade of a tree, his first sip didn't taste like the lemonade he knew, but it was all he had, so he kept sipping. And that whiskey took hold, and he could barely walk a straight line back, and it made him feel all silly. What is going on? Cole, get over here. Yes, sir. Son, did you drink from that jug? No, Pa. Are you sure? I didn't drink from the jug, Pa. The 
boy learned two easy lessons that hot summer day. How to drink whiskey and how to lie. The first steps on the road to trouble. But you know, the trip downhill is a fast one, and it goes faster with company. One of Cull's pals was a young fellow by the name of Johnny Hackawain. He was only a year older than Cull, but much more clever when it came to getting into trouble. When the work got to be too much for Cull and Johnny, they would run off to the mill pond. Hey, Johnny, let's use those logs for a raft, huh? Yeah, Cull. Think they'll hold us up? We can test them first. Yeah, works fine. Holds me up okay. <laughs> Yeah, these others are too small. Guess we'll have to share that one. You crazy? I got this one. Get your own. Nah, you've had long enough turn. Let me have it now. Nope. Well, I'll just have to take it from you. <laughs> no, no, Johnny, let go. I can't swim. Stop hollering. I said give me. Help. Help. Johnny, help. You, you, you mean you really can't swim? Help. Here, grab hold. Hang on. Hold. Oh, hang on. <laughs> Johnny was kind of a hero to call. Together, they thought up more and more ways to make trouble. They didn't really want to hurt anyone, but it just always seemed to turn out that way. They joined a gang of neighborhood boys and called themselves the Midnight Marauders. At first, marauding was limited to stealing watermelon and roasting ears, little things, but conscious seers quickly. They graduated to more serious plunder. Y'all got it straight. Hank, Billy, and Ross will go in and keep old man Richards busy. Now you two, Cull, keep his attention. Then you, Billy, just dip into his cash box and lift enough for us to buy smokes and drinks. I'll watch outside. Got it. Mm -hmm. Keep him busy. Okay, okay. Then, after we get through, we'll mosey over to the Carson farm and borrow some horses. You mean steal some horses? Borrow. Horses are for riding. And riding is what we want to do. We'll turn them loose when we get done. Sounds good. Mm, okay. You say so, Johnny. First, though, let's get to the cash box. Remember, let Billy Spankfield do it while you keep the old gaffer busy. Billy Spankfield got the money all right. But the next afternoon, while going after cows in a thunderstorm, Billy was struck by lightning, and Cole was among the first to find him. Billy! Billy, stop playing dead, you hear me? He ain't playing. He is dead. God struck him down because he stole that money. It was a time of strange, wild weather that week so many years ago. The day of Billy's funeral, a bank of dark, threatening clouds drifted overhead. The little country church was filled, and the air was close. Dearly beloved, when death strikes the very young, it is especially hard to understand. We tend to look up and cry out, why, Lord, why? And the answer is not always ours to know, nor is the fact of our loss easy to accept. But we can know how we ought to accept it as we read of the experience of Job. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. Did you hear that, friends? Job worshipped. In the hour of tragedy, he worshipped. And what did he say? Was it complaint? Was it an outcry of self-pity? Did he accuse God or, or doubt God? No. And Job said, The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Oh my goodness. Ladies, friends, calm yourselves. <laughs> Preacher! Preacher, lightning hit the big elm out front. Big branch come down and there's two dead horses. They're tied to the tree. The loop of the halter rope's still around the trunk, but the rope's burnt right in two. Oh, uh, hear me? 
The judgment of the Lord is just as sure as any lightning bolt. I can't help feeling, even at this most serious and solemn occasion, that some here are not ready to meet their God. Well, just as lightning struck little Billy, just as it sought out the tree just outside, so we can find anyone here in this room. None of us, that's right, none of us knows the time or place God will take us. Are you ready? Have you faced the fact that you're a sinner? Have you repented, turned from self and sin to follow the Savior? God loves you. You know that, don't you? Jesus already paid for your redemption. Are you ready to receive it as a gift? Friends, there is no magic in an altar of prayer, but it is a good and suitable place for you to settle things with God. Yes, come. That preacher was sensitive to the mood of the people and to the counsel of the Holy Spirit. The funeral service became a revival meeting. Twelve people received Christ that day, but Cull wasn't one of them, nor was his friend Johnny. Folks, we'll get back to Cull's story in just a moment, but first, I want to share a bit about how our ministry is able to bring hope to people all over the world. Unshackled is now in its 71st year of spreading the good news through powerful stories about real people. Our success is a result of God's blessing and the involvement of, well, supporters like you. When you contribute to Unshackled, it has a direct impact. Your support allows us to hire quality writers, talented actors, as you can hear, a skilled production team, and a devoted staff. Through your support, we're able to share Unshackled worldwide. So, in order to continue the work of spreading the gospel and allowing us to offer this program for free, won't you consider making a donation to Unshackled? It's really quite easy. All you need to do is click on the live link, if there's one where you're listening, or visit our podcast website at unshackledpodcast.org. That's unshackledpodcast.org. Dot org and then click the donate button. Or you can always write a check, unshackled. We take checks. You mail that check to 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. We thank you for your partnership in our ministry. And now, back to part one of the classic true story of Call Wilcox. When Johnny and Cole hardened their hearts during that strange funeral service for their young friend, they seemed to have come to some sort of a turning point in their life, young as they were. Actually, Cole might have responded to that invitation given while thunder rolled across the sky, but for the fact that his friends refused to move. So, Cole was afraid to respond. And from then on, the entire group seemed headed for trouble. Time passed, they grew older, and their ideas of diversion changed. When they had money, they spent their evenings at a shabby crossroads establishment that was about 10% general store and 90% saloon. Yeah, they tell me old Hellfire's having special meetings this week. The preacher? Yep. And I've been thinking, we gotta go listen to the old boy. You, Johnny? You don't want to hear a preacher. I'll tell you, Cull, he was pretty clever. The way he used that thunderstorm to scare people, remember? It had me about half scared. Well, you'd grown up since then, so have I. I've been thinking we ought to go give him some more thunder. I don't just see what you You will, Cull. <laughs> hey, let's buy a bottle to keep us warm on the way over there. We'll stir up a real storm for old Hellfire. <laughs> By the time those young men reached the church, they were pretty full of whiskey. They stumbled to a bench at the rear of the room. After a minute or two, Johnny began to stir up his storm. Friends, <laughs> it does my heart good to see that in spite of the snow and the cold, so many of you have come here tonight. Perhaps like John Wesley, your hearts have been strangely warmed. <laughs> Uh, I believe that something has warmed you from within. Oh, yes, brother. 
uh, <laughs> as I was saying, uh, Come on. Uh, shall we sing that fine old song, Amazing Grace? Oh, sure. such a disturbance. You young men are welcome, believe me, doubly welcome, because you are strangers to this place. But this is a house of worship. Because of that, and for the sake of others here, I must ask you to be quiet. Well, how do you uh, like the storm, preacher? I beg your pardon. Oh, Nary, I like the bold either. Yeah, no. <laughs> Just a minute, preacher. It's all well and good to be patient, but we didn't come to hear puppies barking. Now, you go along, boys. Go back tomorrow night when you're sober. Oh, I just suppose we don't want to go along. <laughs> I see. Well, Henry, yeah. Ollie, yeah. maybe you better give us a hand. Oh, Wine is a mocker. Strong <laughs> drink is raging. These boys need to cool off out in the snow. Oh, That's no. right. Come on now. <laughs> oh, hey, 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 take your hands off. Hey, hey, let, hey, me, hey. let me go. I'm oh, leaving. Oh, I'm oh, leaving. Oh, Remember, boys, you can come back anytime, provided you're sober. All right, preacher. Let the meeting continue. Thank you, deacon. Friends, before we do anything else, I suggest we have a season of prayer for the souls of these young men. Well, Johnny, that storm of yours didn't last very long. No, but it was fun while it lasted. Come on. Where? Right over here in the shed, where they've tied up their horses and rakes. It's out of the wind a little, but we can't stay here. I yeah, don't mean to stay, but a minute. <gasps> Look here. This cutter belongs to the deacon. What about it? Oh, we've got a long, cold walk ahead of us. Seems like this buffalo robe ought to keep us warm. Oh, should at that. <laughs> oh, and looky here. Silver-mounted whip and sleigh bells. <laughs> The old goat sure is proud of these doodads. We'll just take them all along. <laughs> the boys didn't really see it as stealing. To them, it was more like a prank. They made their way to Johnny's house where they spent the night. And then, late the following morning, their prank turned serious. There's a cutter coming up from the road. Somebody paying us a visit. Johnny, you expecting company? No, Ma. Did you say a cutter? Prettiest little sleigh. Why, it's Deacon Martin. It's who? Deacon Martin, and the sheriff's with him. Any idea what he'd want here? Uh, no. No idea at all. Cully? Mm, no, ma'am. Well, we'll know in a minute. He's walking up to the door. Go let him in, Johnny. Uh, you do it, Ma. What did you say to me? I thought I'd go out back uh, and uh, get you some stove wood. Yeah. Hmm. Seems to me you noticed it in a terrible sudden hurry. You just stay right here. Ma! I said don't you move. Coming! Morning, ma'am. Morning, Deacon. Come in. Better have the sheriff come in, too. Pretty cold out there. I asked the sheriff to wait in the cutter for a moment. Hello, Johnny. Call? Oh, morning. You boys have anything to tell me about last night? What about last night, Deacon? Just a moment, ma'am. Well, boys? Uh, don't know what you're talking about. Uh, me neither, Deacon. And neither do I, but I think I'd better know. Well, some valuable things are missing, Mrs. McElwain, and the boys had something to do with it. Are you sure? Very sure. There were tracks in the snow, two sets of tracks. 
And they left a pretty unusual mark. You're lying, Deacon. It was snowing and we didn't leave no tracks. You're right, Johnny. It was snowing. But the snow didn't cover the tracks you left in the shed. So you see I'm not lying. Now, mind if I look at your overshoes? He's bluffing, Ma. No, Johnny. I think you are. I'd hope we might settle this and recover the stolen things without further involving the sheriff. And I say you're lying. Well, Mrs. McElwain? I think. Deacon, you better call the sheriff in. Ma! I can't very well protect a thief. The local jail didn't amount to much. Crime was rare in that quiet section of Ohio, but a jail is a jail, and by evening the two boys were frightened and growing desperate. I don't understand why my pa don't come and get us out. Doubt if he will. Why? Probably figures to teach us both a good lesson. Your pa and the deacon both. Oh, but I want out of here. So do I, so do I. And maybe we will get out. I don't know how. Oh, I do. Take a good look at that ceiling. See that trapdoor? Yeah. If we could get up in the loft, we ought to be able to find a way outside. And then what? And then we'll go down to the tracks and wait by the water tank. The night freight always makes a water stop. By morning, we'll be in Cleveland. Once you start to run from something, you're committed to the life of a fugitive and it's hard to turn back. In Cleveland, living in a cheap room on the waterfront, Johnny and Cole found this to be true. Any good job notices in that paper, Cole? Nothing we can do. There is something here, though. What? Trouble, Johnny. Big trouble. Let me see. $50 reward for information concerning the whereabouts of John McElwain and Cole Wilcox and then it gives a description of both of us. We can't stay here. We're only 30 miles from being back in jail. You're right. We're getting out of here, right now. The boys stole a horse and sleigh near the edge of the city and drove some 15 miles. It was near midnight when they came to a railroad crossing and a water tank. A westbound passenger train was taking on water. Well. That train would take us a long way by morning. Sure, but where could we ride? The blind baggage, between the baggage car and the tender. What about the horse and sleigh? Forget about them. Well, they'd only get us in more trouble. Come on! Running in the snow beside the moving train, Johnny got a hold of the grab iron at the head of the baggage car and swung aboard. Cole tried to do the same, his cold hands slipped, and he almost fell under the wheels. Johnny grabbed his arm and yanked him up onto the step. The boys were half frozen when they reached Chicago, and they had less than a dollar between them. They had a drink apiece in a Halstead saloon. That entitled them to a sandwich at the free lunch counter and gave them a chance to warm up. Later, back on the street, they passed a huge wooden building. Funny looking place, like a wooden circus tent. Sign says it's a tabernacle? Yeah, um, Evangelist Dwight L. Moody. Who's he? Oh, I've heard about him. Goes all over the world preaching. Well, maybe we ought to go inside, it looks warm. And if he don't preach too loud, maybe we could snooze. <laughs> Moody, of course, turned out to be a short, stocky man with a beard. He spoke so clearly and convincingly that Cole wanted to get his life settled with God. During the closing hymn, Moody seemed to look right at Cole as he said, Why not now? I don't want curiosity seekers, but if you come seeking forgiveness, you'll find God has already provided it through his son. Let's go, Cole. Huh? You, Johnny? I said, let's go down there. Well, well, sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was when Johnny mocked the service. 
and Mr. Moody himself had to get the boys to leave. As he had said, he couldn't help curiosity seekers. Once again, God was speaking to Call. He was almost persuaded, but he held back, put it off. And so, with Johnny, he continued to be a fugitive, running from the law, from God, and from his own conscience. On the next Unshackled, you'll learn where that flight took him. Listening friend, the world is full of fugitives like Cull Wilcox. It's possible to be clean with the law, but unclean with God and with oneself, tormented by guilt. You may be such a fugitive, but you don't have to go on running. Rather, Jesus says in Matthew 11:28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Friend, if you would like further resources to help you in making the crucial decision that Call kept running away from, we encourage you to get in touch with us here at Pacific Garden Mission, 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607 or call 1-888-NEED-HIM. Now, we love hearing from our listeners here on the Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast, so send us your questions and we'll answer them here. It can be something you're curious about or just something you want to share with us. All you have to do is write us at podcast at unshackled.org or call and leave us a message at 312-281-1264. We'd love to hear from you. Now, Before we get to our sweepstakes drawing info, I just want to remind you to subscribe or like our Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast. You can even share it or tell a friend. We'd also love for you to review or rate our podcast, and don't forget to check out our other podcasts on this same platform, Unshackled Daily Devotionals and Unshackled in Person. We appreciate your input and involvement in our ministry. And again, please consider supporting us so we can freely offer quality Christian programming to the world. All right, the prize for this sweepstakes contest is another beautiful wooden scripture plaque. The verse on this one is Psalm 34.1, which says, I will bless the Lord at all times. This is a gorgeous little thing, especially if you're looking for daily inspiration from scripture. You will love this authentic wooden plaque. The plaque has been sawn from a tree branch or log and cut in such a way as to retain as much of the bark around the perimeter as possible. And this one's even got some (laughs) extra character, as it looks like a knot from the tree was sawn off with it. If you'd like a peek at this scripture plaque, you're welcome to visit our podcast website, unshackledpodcast.org, and stop by the audio drama page for a picture. And next time... Let's easy up, Johnny. We put a lot of miles between us and that corral. Yeah, I reckon you're right. We've been pushing these horses hard. It looks to me like we got some bad weather coming. I'd hate to be caught up here in a storm. I'd just hate to be caught. (laughs) By the people from that corral back there, not a chance. Call Wilcox believed he could outrun trouble, mainly because he had. You know, we've been pretty lucky. You think it's luck? It has to be. A fugitive living on his own terms, Call wasn't slowing down to face consequences that couldn't catch him. Uh, I can't... I can't believe I made it. Only God came face to face with Call and would make him face the fragility of his own humanity. All right, God, I admit it. I knew I was fighting you. Don't miss part two of this exciting classic true story of William Cullen Wilcox. Coming soon on Unshackled. Heard in the classic true story of William Cullen Wilcox, Part 1, were Brian Plaharchik, Steve Bayorgin, Brad Armacost, Gary Brichetto, Marcy Mencotti, and Stephen Spencer. Original music, Don Bador. Sound effects, Martin Robinson. Recording engineer, David Pierczynski. Audio engineer, Michael Kahn. Script, Joe Musser and Kylie Hammond. That's it for this week's Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast. So until next time, unless our Lord returns before then, I'm Timothy Gregory, your brother in Christ. <laughs>